We are delighted to be joined this weekend by Professor Hal Tausig. Hal's vocation is marked by an intersection of academic and congregational experience. For 30 years he was, has been a scholar and a working pastor. He's been professor at both the Reconstructionist Rabbi, Rabbinical College in Philadelphia and Union Theological Seminary in New York, which is a particularly good theological school. At Union, Hal's teaching ranged widely through the New Testament and the recent new documents discovered from the Christ communities of the first and second centuries. In the spring of 2015, Hal retired from over 30 years of being on the pastoral staff of churches in Philadelphia. His whole career has been bivocational, with deep roots in the academy and the church. And in terms of the church work, he's widely known for his experimental worship, which fitted well with his international scholarly leadership about early Christian workshop. And in the workshop that he will deliver this morning and again after lunch, Hal will talk about imperatives for new Christian worship today. He's spoken widely in the US in both academic and church settings and in the media. And the biggest draw over the past three years has been the book that he will be talking to us about this morning, A New New Testament, A Bible for the 21st Century, combining traditional and newly discovered documents. It's been a controversial um, book. I read a couple of little reviews about it. Um, one from the Presbyterian layman said, having sought to strip Jesus of his divinity through the Jesus Seminar, Tausig's latest project seeks to strip the Bible of its authority. So, but I also I rather more, felt more warmly towards Barbara Brown Taylor's review when she said, a new New Testament does what some of us never dreamed possible. It opens the treasure chest of early Christian writings, restoring a carefully selected few of them to the rightful place in the broad conversation about who Jesus was, what he did and taught, and what all of that has to do with us now. So please join me in welcoming back our guest speaker, Professor Hal Tausig. Thank you so much, Margaret, for your kind invitation and, and all that you are doing here. Thank you all for being present uh, today. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, all of um, what lies before us, uh, especially given the, the really wonderful and deep uh, interactions we had last night. So, rarely when I'm introducing a new New Testament, um, I, do I get almost two, or almost an hour and a half. Um, uh, and we're going to do that in about 15 minute segments. That is, uh, I'm going to talk for 15 minutes and then we'll, I'll ask for responses from you for five or 10 minutes and then I'll go on. Just so that I'm uh, understanding exactly where you would like to go, um, uh, uh, that will allow us a bit more flexibility. You need to know that I'm good at cutting someone off when they go on and on. Um, and you need to know that I cannot do this work without hearing from you. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Let's start then with, with some basic proposals and, and information. The longer I work with the texts from beyond the New Testament that have been discovered in, since 1850, the more I'm sure that basically the discovery of new texts from the most ancient parts of the early Christ movements is the biggest thing that has happened to the Bible in 1500 years. Uh, so that's my, my proposal, that um, never has the Bible experienced so much problematic and promising content as in the last 100 to 150 years. There are over 100 documents that have been disco discovered in that time. That is essentially what has happened is we have two to three times the amount of material that we thought we had. Now, the fly in the ointment, the problem 
is with us scholars and clerics, as far as I'm concerned, because as it began to unfold that, that North Africa, and we'll get back to North Africa in a minute, that North Africa was basically producing all of these documents um, over a relatively short period of time. We scholars and we church people had a resoundingly clear answer. And that was something like, don't worry, all of this is junk that we're, we've found. Very clearly, especially we scholars in our so-called leadership over the past 50, uh, uh, 150 years, we made clear to as many colleagues and as much to the public and church as possible that all of the discoveries could be summarized in the term her heresy or second-rate literature. We hadn't read them, but we pronounced on them anyway. It's, it's sometimes a habit of scholars to do that, but never quite as much as it has been on this subject. And speaking personally, and I'll say a little bit more about that, speaking personally, the reason is we were embarrassed. We, had, we didn't have the background to address these new texts, and so we insulted them. What has happened then over that period of time is that a wonderful combination of church nonsense and academic sloth um, has produced the fact that um, indeed the material has been by and large sidelined until I would want to say the last 20 years in which the public started reading the material. And the public started saying back to the scholars and the churches, this stuff is pretty good. Now, they didn't mean all of the stuff because they had some sense that was greater than the, the, the pastors and the scholars um, to notice that some of it was really confusing um, and some of it was downright insulting but more of it was inspiring I can't tell you how long I followed exactly this path in the first half of my career um, speaking widely across my country about the New Testament material, I, I hardly ever spoke when someone didn't come up to me afterwards and say, hey, did you hear that they discovered such and such a document? And I was completely reassuring to them that they did not need to go further. Um, it was just, I needed to be bludgeoned, as did my colleagues, by the public, which said, please talk to me about this. It wasn't until the mid-1990s, um, after at least a decade of me stonewalling conversation on all fronts, that I started putting that into my graduate uh, school curriculum. Um, and it wasn't five years from then that my students at Union Theological Seminary in New York said, could I please do a PhD with you about the, th this material? In other words, all we had to do was just give a little bit of an opening. And, and um, a lot of inspiration, puzzlement, and and raw energy came forth around these texts. How did this happen, first of all, that, they all, that we discovered so much all at once? It's rather simply and stunningly accidental. So in the mid-19th century, it turned out that European rich people, 
started going to the southern Mediterranean and the eastern Mediterranean on vacation. And it turned out that among those rich people were Bible scholars, professors. And then, especially in Egypt, it, this was the case that a, a biblical scholar would, in 1870 or 1880, um, be wandering around um, a market. And someone would start showing them ancient papyri. And what happened is those accidentally interested scholars started bringing that stuff back and reading it. Why North Africa? Again, very simple answer. So if, when we'll see the Gospel of Mary in a minute, if, it, let's say, the Gospel of Mary, there was a manuscript of it, and there were many manuscripts of it, um, if there was a manuscript of the Gospel of Mary in Greece or Syria or Israel or current day um, Italy, the, gospel, the, the manuscript would disappear. It was simply too wet. It would simply go away unless you had ways of preserving it, which no one did. But... <laughs> In North Africa, it was so dry that papyri last for thousands of years. We have stuff carbon dated back 3,000 years. So in other words, an accidental coincidence of taking vacations and dry weather was what happened. There's this great... Um, ambitious Cambridge and Oxford uh, dig that, was, that started in the 1890s. <laughs> uh, because they had heard that there was an entire ancient city uh, in Middle Egypt called Oxyrhynchus. Anybody heard of Oxyrhynchus? One person, yes! <laughs> um, Oxyrhynchus um, was an ancient city. One minor problem for the colonialists from England, um, there was a real city on top of it. And with their great colonialist uh, consciousness, they decided not to dare da tear down the uh, 19th century city on top of the ancient city. But in the process, and before the archaeological dig started, they discovered that the trash from the ancient city was outside both cities. So they could dig up the trash dump. They spent a decade digging up the trash. They found old tools, a lot of um, remnants of people eating and drinking, and tons of papyri, tons of them. They were there for almost a decade as a huge team. Look online and you can see pictures of them digging in the trash dump. I mean, it wasn't a trash dump then, uh, then because it was all dried up. <laughs> So they, as good colonialists, finally, they took it all back to England. They packed box after box after box, put them on ships, and took it all back to England. They started around the turn of the 20th century, they started a team of 10 to open the boxes and, and look at what they'd found, really. That team, well, not said the same people, that team started at the turn of the 20th century is still working on that task. They haven't gotten through all the boxes and they've already discovered two new gospels. They're 10% done with the job. Two new gospels, that would mean, you know, using some kind of math, there are gonna be 20 new gospels out of when they finally finish in a century or so.
breathtaking. So this is what I mean uh, by saying this is a really big thing that has, that now, in other words, there's no conspiracy to it. We simply know a lot more. We have a lot more than we thought we had. So now Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are going to be feeling different when we know that there are 20 other Gospels. Let me stop here and have you um, think about this with me. Comments, protests, comments, protests, questions. Let's take a few minutes. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, you wanna, probably want to say that again because I think your mic isn't on. Hello. Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I was just. I, I heard you, but say yeah, it again yeah. loudly. I, I was just saying it's just speculation. There are twenty new gospels. I mean, that's just a, an estimate, a, a wild thought. But um, you know, fair enough. There are lots of documents. Thanks so much. I misspoke. I in by twenty gospels. I wasn't referring to the to the guests around Oxyrhynchus, I was, uh, I was referring to uh, Robert Miller's book of about, the, uh, was written about 15 years ago called The Complete Gospels. He names 23 and, and has them included in that. So yes, you're right, there might be 43. Um, uh, but but Robert, Robert Miller has, has the text of 23. It's a really wonderful book, yeah, thanks. Yes. You, then you. <laughs> oh, here we go with. Oh, okay. All right, then you. <laughs> and then you too. Uh, am I next? Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Um, yes, look, I think the um, issue that hasn't been addressed so far is that somehow the canon was inspired by the Holy Spirit and uh, of course the Gospels that we have were inspired by the Holy Spirit and that a whole lot of other stuff was thrown out because it was considered not inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I guess the question I've got is how do we test this? Uh, how do we know that, that the, you use the word when you spoke to your uh, people who said that they were interested in it and you told them that it was either junk or heretical, how do we know that there wasn't a good reason for chucking this stuff out? Yeah, thanks. That's really an important thing. I I'm going to deflect about half of that question because we're going to be working on it later, but let me just give us a little uh, clue. I, um, I love the way... so the. It turns out, and we'll look at this a little bit later, that the New Testament itself took five, 500 years to produce. Um, there was no such thing as a New Testament for uh, a, a good 400 years. Um, uh, so we'll, and we'll lay that out in, in, in a little bit. But my favorite thinking about that um, was Irenaeus at the end of the first century, at the end of the second century. Irenaeus, as some of you know, was kind of a heresy baiter. Um, but he was the first person to use the term New Testament, um, uh, as, as far as, as we know, and he, um, he was also the first person to propose four Gospels. Now, when he used the term New Testament, he didn't mean a book. He just meant something to be alongside of the Hebrew Bible, which was the other testament. Um, um, uh, so he at that point per said, I think we should have four Gospels, because he knew there were a lot more, um, and, I, and he named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so I don't trust much of what Irenaeus says, frankly, but I love what he said about why four Gospels, 
because there are four winds that blow and four corners to the earth. Yeah, right, so the first thing to do about Irenaeus is to laugh because that doesn't hold water for us today, right? That's not going to help us decide really um, because we think there are about 23 winds that blow, right? Or, or something like that. There are a lot of winds, not just four. Um, but the lovely thing about Irenaeus uh, is it's clear from that definition that he wasn't going for unanimity. He didn't want four gospels that said the same thing. And he named them because they didn't say the same thing. In other words, he wanted four winds to blow. He wanted to hear from four corners, not just one. So one of the things I think that we know about the general question you raise, which we'll get to a little bit later, is, is that um, the very earliest thinkers on that, some of which we don't like, were going for diversity. One more comment and we'll, we'll move on. Yes. I'm just interested, the texts that were being sold in the marketplace, were people reading them and having any kind of oral or spiritual tradition about them over those years? Mm. Yeah, thanks. And, and ma'am, I think I promised you after this, so let's stay with you too. Um, so yeah, that's a really easy question. Um, uh, uh, they, um, no, they didn't know the language, first of all, so they weren't reading them. Um, and secondly, but see, even in the, in the 19th century, there was an antiquities market, for instance, in Cairo. So it was good business to find old stuff and sell it to Europeans. Ma'am? Here. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, good. All right. So let's, let's go on. So, so let me put some of my cards on the table. Um, um, now, so the way... Uh, uh, we produced a new New Testament, um, uh, and by the way, just to be very clear, everybody keeps calling it the New New Testament, and that's the last thing I want. In the book itself, I say, why don't we have five New New Testaments? Um, because, I mean, if one takes the traditional New Testament as a as a a, a guide, which I sometimes do and sometimes don't. Um, uh, it, it is. Um, it took 500 years to produce. So with a whole bunch of new documents, why would we want to throw together something and say it's finished? Um, uh, but what we did there, um, and uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, um, a major American uh, publishing company, um, was has been unbelievably gracious on this. I said to them, as, as my agent got in, in touch with them for me, I said, um, what I'd like to do is add some of these newly discovered texts to the regular New Testament um, to see how it read alongside of it. Mainly because I had been, by that time, for 15 years teaching it at the graduate level and in churches, where one week we would have a sermon on the Gospel of Mark, and another week we'd have it on the Gospel of Mary. One week we'd have it on the Acts of the Apostles, next we would have a, a, a sermon on the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Um, so I knew that, from my point of view, there was a, an amazing new, greater family of texts from the earliest Christ communities. Um, and that it was helpful to us spiritually to have this larger text. But what I also knew is that it would be totally silly if I decided which text to add. So I asked Houghton Mifflin Harcourt um, if I could have leading spiritual leaders from the United States study 70 of these new books with me and decide which ones were worth putting in. So they said yes. They said we will pay for them to come and meet with you. We will pay for 20 people to study 
and these would be no, people of notoriety. So it ended up being like Barbara Brown Taylor, for me, one of the most beautiful writers of, of uh, theology in our time, um, Karen King from Harvard, um, four bishops from different denominations. Uh, there were five. There was a, uh, a Catholic bishop who had also agreed and got sick, or at least said he got sick. No, he did get sick. Um, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and a number of heads of denominations. Uh, so, so and, and most of the, I would call a bunch of people I knew and a bunch of people I didn't know and say, how about, uh, so the, the um, publisher said, we're not going to pay them anything because that would look like you'd be paying certain people to make certain choices. So they wouldn't pay anything. They just make sure that the, 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 their expenses were paid um, in, in this project. And um, so that's what we did for a year. And in the end, um, they voted for 10. And I'd, a I'd asked the publisher, how many can we add? <laughs> a little uh, um, gluttonous on my part. Um, uh, and, and they said, as many as are good. And so this, what we called the Council of New Orleans, where they finally um, decided on which ones, they said, um, uh, we will have 10. We, we want to be conservative, meaning we don't want to, and, and they said, what are, what are the, your criteria, Hal, for having us make this decision? I said, you all are famous for telling the public what to do and what to read. So do have your criteria and be in a conscientious relationship with the public. And they did their best. We had great arguments. I only got six of mine in um, uh, and, and was a poor loser um, uh, in, in the fights. Um, but we actually ended up really liking each other over, over the year. So, so that, I just want to tell you that I'm not an um, objective um, party in this. I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur to help the larger public and the larger church think about this new situation um, in as conscientious a way as, as possible. But I, I, I have my own interests and, I, um, and I'm a bad loser when I lose a couple of rounds. Um, so, so let me stop there and have you cross-examine me on my ethics or, or the possibilities of this. I, I would need to say that, um, that this is really selling well. It's been on the market since 2013. I, I've been on the road way more than I wanted to, um, but I, I stopped writing um, for, for, for uh, two years. I stopped writing my n new books. I, I've since written two others, but I, um, I stopped writing because I wanted to simply listen to the larger public uh, in the media and, and, and in, in other situations. So, any any thoughts or questions? Um, yes, Val. I'm wondering which four of yours didn't get in and why. <laughs> Just you briefly. Know, you know, the great thing is I forget. <laughs> no, I do remember that we had a knockdown, dragout fight in the last day, in which one of my leading. Um, uh, mentees won the argument over me about the so-called Didache. Um, the Didache, that's, and, and again, see, this is what's happened, what we scholars did with um, all of the, the, um, the new discoveries. We named them in foreign languages so people wouldn't care. Right? Um, so, so, um, so the Didache shouldn't be called the Didache. It's a totally stupid, self-serving move by scholars. Um, it should be called what it's called in English, the, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. <laughs>
Now, if I said, hey, do you want to read the Didache or the teaching of the 12 apostles? Which one do you, what, what would you say? Okay, other thoughts or questions, protests? Oh, there are three back there. Um, this person here said, that, you know, it was all inspired by the Holy Spirit, but my understanding is that the process of developing the first canon was just as political as your process of adding to it. Mm. Okay, this is really fun. We'll, we'll, I, rather than ha having me give a little contact, I'll just give you little dribs and drabs of thinking until we cover it all. But let me say to this, it's worse than that. Um, I frankly think there's, there's not much politics to it. It's just sloppy, random stuff. So for instance, um, I was taught in graduate school in two different ways, things that were totally bunk, um, um, and that was that either Constantine decided or Athanasius decided what was in the New Testament. Um, uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. And or that some, some council uh, decided it. So we, as far as we can tell, there are two regional councils. That's like a synod, right? It's not an all church council. Hippo and... Um, uh, and one other location um, in North Africa we're, we're not quite sure of, um, um, uh, both had councils that provided a list of what books they thought people should read. They didn't use the term New Testament, but this is in the fourth century. But we have no direct writing at all from either of those regional councils. But what I was taught in seminary is Hippo was the turning point. But we don't even have any documents from Hippo, um, first, first of all. And secondly, it wasn't a grand uh, council of all churches. It was a little piece of North Africa. The first council that names, the all church council, that names what should be in the New Testament, you will just either you will laugh or scorn me, um, is Trent. You know when Trent was? The 16th century. There is no council action in the first thousand years that says what should be in the New Testament. And the reason that Trent finally did it in the 16th century was Martin Luther was trying to take um, both James and Revelation to John out. So that wasn't about let's get our acts together at Trent. It was let's fight Luther. And it's not that there wasn't a Bible. So for instance, by the 14th century, most Bibles, so you couldn't even make a Bible until the 8th century, right? The, 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 the um, mechanical simply couldn't do it. You couldn't put 27 books um, of the New Testament in one book until about the 8th century you figured it out. But in the 14th century, when you have a bunch of Bibles, 90% of them agree on what's in it, right? 90% 90, 90 of those Bibles um, uh, say the 27 books that we now have in the New Testament. And 10% disagree. In other words, just to get at your question, it is a terribly, interestingly, wonderfully sloppy process. Two, two more folks there. Can I just ask how, um, is the Gospel of Thomas included in those Gospels that you're discussing? Yeah, yeah we, we picked three Gospels. Um, we picked the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of Truth. Yeah. Well, I'm one of those people who read the Gospel of Thomas quite early when it was published, just a lay person, and I immediately recognized that it was a profound book. These days I attend the Quakers, and one of the basic tenets of the Quakers is that there is God in everybody, and the Gospel of Thomas, as I read it, um, is basically about discovering the eternal inspirations inside oneself 
I can see why the church didn't like it because it took away from the authority of the church hierarchy and put it firmly inside every one of us. And um, it just on a general theme as we're veering towards it, it just made me wonder then why one would talk about particularly inspired texts when around us even today, you know, there are great poets writing inspired texts and why are they of different category? You know, I just felt completely emancipated by my reading of the book of Thomas because it just made me feel, well, you know, I know in myself that this is profound truth and I find profound truth in a lot of texts and just made me feel as my friend here, well, why would we trust people who uh, have behaved so um, inauthentically in the past to reinterpret these things and insist that they are particularly inspired? Oh, thank you so much. So you all just need to know this person who just spoke is the hero of this story, right? Did you hear what she said? She discovered it. And that's the larger picture, is lay people did the hard work, and you are the hero. So, so that's really important that we just saw what has gone on, and we saw the kind of people we need to thank for it. Now, a couple of thoughts about that, um, in addition, We'll be looking at, at, uh, at Thomas a little bit uh, uh, later on in this hour, um, but not doing it justice because we're going to look at some other ones too. But um, I myself have backed off from conspiracy theories about how the New Testament came into being. Um, just because it was such a sloppy um, process and because the earliest leaders that began thinking about that like Irenaeus whom I don't trust generally wanted diversity not unanimity in it so from my point of view it doesn't serve us particularly well to think that all of the bad ones were put in and all the good ones were left out um, uh, it seems to me much more haphazard and comical uh, as to what got in. Um, from my point of view, and so just to say a little bit more about um, how we have come. So there's been one scholar who was standing alongside you all the time, and that's Elaine Pagels. Elaine's book single-handedly gave most of us our first knowledge of those books. Um, Elaine and I are really good colleagues together, talk a lot about this, share uh, PhD students, um, and she is the one. Having said that, I want to say Elaine's take in her book was really helpful, but um, right now has the problem that she basically said, the ones that she's talking about, the Gnostic Gospels, she calls them. That's a problem in, in term, but that doesn't matter. She says basically that they're better than the ones in the New Testament. I think, I think it's, it's not fair to say the, one, the New Testament is better or the ones outside. It's just more complicated than that. Yes. ask because I was pleased that you men mentioned um, Athanasius. Um, uh, Oxering? Oh, Athanasius, yes. yes. Right. And because I'm rather fond of the heresy and, uh, you know, I think that what I'm wondering is whether or not there is any redress. I mean, you've said that um, the one is not better than the other, but clearly from our experience as a you know, progressive congregation, there is a problem and that is that it's very male focused, the current uh, Bible, uh, New Testament. Um, it's written in that culture. It's, there are snippets of uh, 
the possibility of uh, the feminine, but not a lot. And so I'm wondering, just my question is, are we going in these 10 documents, are we going or do we experience something more of the heresy of Athanasius? Do we get uh, a much more, a stronger Gnostic focus? Mm. That's a really big mouthful, thank you. Um, I, I won't do justice to all of your thoughts. Um, uh, let's for the moment disagree um, on, on whether the bad stuff is in the New Testament um, uh, and, and the good stuff outside. Um, I could be wrong on that. I should say here generally um, what I, I need to say in every talk I give, um, whether it's on this stuff or not. Um, when anybody like me says, and, and we're pretty sure that, and follows up with a statement in the, about the first or second century, I'm probably lying. Really. It's really hard to be a his, historian of the early times. Um, and we, we simply always oversell ourselves. So please know that you may be right uh, on that front. Um, I, I think that, um, let's just take one piece of it. So Elaine now agrees that Gnosticism and the word Gnostic are not helpful words. Um, she's been coming to that lately, but this is basically the work of Karen King at Harvard, um, who actually writes books with Elaine as well. And Karen has won the day for much of the, uh, much of the scholarship now being done. And that is Gnosticism was, is a late invention. The term Gnosticism doesn't occur until the 17th century. And it occurs in the time in which Protestants and Catholics were arguing about them, the other one being wrong. And Protestants came up with this idea that there was an ancient heresy called Gnosticism. And that the Catholics were like that. That's the first time we had, the term Gnosticism does not exist at all in the ancient world. The term Gnostic does, and it means somebody who is smart. And therefore, like sometimes in the ancient world, when somebody is smart, someone uses the same term to, to say that they are um, um, pretentiously smart. So there is occasional ancient use of the term Gnostic to say somebody too smart for her good or too smart for his good. Um, but um, Elaine now says to all of her doctoral students, you may not use the term Gnosticism or Gnostic in your work because it is a paper tiger of heresy. Um, so I would want to say, Elaine is backing off of there is being there is a really wonderful cache of material called Gnostic. So we're just working on this. We we are not all the way there. We're always wrong. Elaine's wrong. I'm wrong. Karen's wrong. Um, all of the time, and sometimes we're right. I'm going to go on. Thank you so much for. And I'm sorry that I'm short cutting all of your questions and thoughts. Um. So let's look at a, a text or two. You've got your handout. Has everybody got a handout? Um, let's, let's look for a moment um, at the first um, page after the title page, the prayer of thanksgiving. You want to find the prayer of thanksgiving? So this oddly uh, um, focuses a little bit on material that we're going to cover this afternoon when I talk a little bit about ancient worship. Um, but uh, just for you to know that my four books on a a ancient early worship um, um, uh, is, um, is a part of a larger consensus in scholarship now that worship in the first two centuries was almost entirely 
long, rowdy meals. If you ask how did the early Christ people and the second century Christian people, how did they worship? So here's the hint that we don't get in church. Remember all the times when we're reading the Bible in church and it says, and while they were at table? Well, that does hint, hint that there might be a table in play, right? But that's a terrible translation from the Greek because the words at table in Greek mean and when they were lying down that doesn't mean and going to sleep that's the way the ancients ate so every place that Jesus is at table every place that the disciples are at table even in the feeding of the 5,000 um, it's all lying down. It's these luscious, powerful, expressive meals with lots of drinking, lots of joking, lots of teaching, lots of eating. And it gets so wild that not only does Paul say, could you settle down a little bit? But Paul also says, I can't quite get to why you're so excited. It's because the atmosphere itself is beautifully lush, full of emotion and excitement. They called it, in the ancient world, they called it the festive meals. So, um, this, the prayer of thanksgiving, is a prayer at one of those meals. They prayed a lot, they sang a lot, and... Um, because I want um, the reading of the of a new New Testament to be not just thoughtful but spiritual, we decided we should start the book with a prayer from the first century. Um, you'll see at the top, this is the prayer they said. And at the end it says, on 13, And when they said these things in prayer, they welcomed one another, and they went to eat their holy food, which had no blood in it. Kosher, right? Um, uh, um, so this is a ode. It's a deep poem prayer about unity with God. Um, and... Uh, I'll just give you a little bit. If you would look at verse um, eight, nine, or eight, nine, and ten, um, we'll get a little bit of the flavor. O womb of all that grows, we have known you. O womb, pregnant with the nature of the Father, we have known you. O never-ending endurance of the Father, who gives birth. So we worship your goodness. Well, when's the last time you called God a womb? Wanna, anybody want to raise your hand? No, it's not a part of our vocabulary. But we who are so unsure of ourselves now about our own vocabulary, why wouldn't we want to think about God as a womb of all that grows. This is um, new territory for us. It wasn't new territory for the early Christ people. You see, um, we were very conservative in our translations. Um, intentionally, I hired a Coptic scholar, one of my former students, um, uh, to do the Coptic, and we said, we are not going to make up good modern words so that it can make us feel better. Because this is going to be one of the chances the public has in the next generation to read this stuff. So why should we fool them with, with spiffy translations that aren't from, in this case, the Coptic? So this isn't something 
we invented. I hope that we're always inventing new language, we in trying to figure out what our worship is. But this is, this is the real deal from the ancient world. Um, and getting back to your question about the feminine or the female material, what the, what the press is saying is that we were prejudiced, prejudiced towards material that had more of that in it. I think it, there's a, it's a larger question, but this is one example. The other thing I want you to note just about these three um, verses um, is it's queer. It is not as straightforwardly feminist as we would like. Um, oh, so it's a womb of all that grows. That's the one I stay with. But you look further down and it's a womb pregnant with the nature of the Father. I can't really figure out, frankly, from the Coptic or the English, whether God, has, whether God the Father has a womb. We know, for instance, in the Odes of Solomon, which is another one of these early books, there, there um, God the Father has breasts that people nurse from. Um, so so I, we're still working on, on what exactly that means, but what I know is that the womb of all that grows is kind of hooked up with the Father, right? And look, in the, look at... Um, um, Verse 10, O never-ending never endurance of the Father who gives birth. So that makes me think that the womb of all that grows may be the Father's womb. I don't know. So anyway, let's pray it for like 20 years and see how it feels. And let's think about it and let's go over the Coptic and things like that. I'm going to go on to the uh, next uh, piece for a moment, and then, and uh, then, if you want some to comment on uh, the prayer of thanksgiving, you can as well. So the next piece is uh, uh, the Gospel of Mary. This is a little bit more known than the uh, uh, prayer of thanksgiving. Um, how many have you of you have read the Gospel of Mary? It looks to me like about 20% of you, right? So I can, I'm can, i going to talk introductorily about the, the Gospel of, of Mary. It was, it was found in, um, in the marketplace in Cairo uh, by a German scholar in the 1890s. Um, we think after almost two generations of scholarship, we think that it was probably written around 120 CE. It could be as early as 80 or as late as 200. Um, we're going to know more after, after another generation or so, I think. But if it's 120 or 125 is what's, what Karen King, who wrote the best book on um, the Gospel of Mary, please read Karen King. Um, uh, her, her book on that is the best thing. There's a lot of speculative books out there, but Karen's is really good. Um, uh, uh, if it's in the 120, 125 range, uh, that would be where most scholars now put the Gospel of Luke and First Timothy. What's interesting to me about that is that um, the Gospel of Luke has more mentions of women than any of the canonical Gospels. Uh, we know now from real careful scholarship that Mark, which prop Luke probably had in hand, there are 18 places where in Mark there is uh, some kind of mention of a man, and in Luke there's a companioning woman. So in where Mark has a story about a man, Luke has a story about a man, and then another story about a woman. Um, uh, so we know that, that, um, that Luke was really interested in the question of leadership of women. And probably, as we say, we now are dating it to 120 or so.
Then there is 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is also really interested in the leadership of women. How many of you have read 1 Timothy recently? It's a diatribe against women's leadership. Um, so in, just remember you, I know you've been really holding on to 1 Timothy. Um, uh, 1 Timothy says that women are saved by childbirth. The way women get to go to God is because they give, they birth children. 1 Timothy says that you've got to watch the young women because all they're interested in is jewelry and gossip. 1 Timothy forbids women to um, be leaders in the church, even deacons, until they are 60 or older. Ridiculous. But see, if you feed, fit this together where, and we'll tell, tell you a little bit more in this, the Gospel of Mary is about women's leadership. The Gospel of Luke is about uh, women's leadership. The Gospel, uh, the First Timothy is about women's leadership. What we know is from inside and outside the canon, there is contestation about women's leadership. And I would want to say inside the canon and outside the canon are both sides. Now, just a little bit about the Gospel of Mary as a story, because it really gets just at this. So the basic story is this really quickly. So Jesus is there talking to the disciples. And it turns out it's his last talk with the disciples. He summarizes what his message is. And then he says, goodbye. Not because he's going down to the corner store, because he's going. And immediately afterwards, the disciples start crying. Well, that's understandable. But their reason for crying, because they just lost him, their crying is because they say, if he, they killed him, what will they do to us? So they're crying because they think they're going to die too. Mary steps forward. She's clearly one of the disciples. And she says, stop crying. Just a pause in the story at that poignant moment. Mary who? We don't know. 25% of all women in Galilee in the first century are named Mary. So there's no other name in this book except Mary. We're pretty sure it's not Mary the mother. She doesn't quite act that way. She's described very cl closely the way the Gospel of Philip describes Mary Magdalene. And that is, she is the one that Jesus loves most. So Mary steps up to the disciples and says, stop crying. Don't you remember who he was? Don't you remember what he just told you about, about his teachings? And they say, oh yeah. And then she, the Gospel of Mary says, and then she turned their hearts to the good. And they started talking about his teachings. Then Peter says, you know, we do know that he liked you better than us. And so is there a chance that he told you stuff that he didn't tell us because now he's gone? She says, yeah, yeah. Well, could you tell us that? Okay. Then she does, except half of that page in the manuscript is left out. So we only have half of what she said, or what he said to her. And then afterwards, Peter and then Andrew say, no, this is wrong. Why would he tell a woman about all this? See, this gospel goes right at the leadership of women in the story. And then Andrew says, yeah, and it sounds weird anyway. 
Then Levi stands up and says, Peter, you have always been a hothead. Don't you remember he loved her more than us? And then we have two copies of the Gospel of Mary. One has one ending, one has the another. In one ending, only Levi comes out of that discussion and goes out like Jesus told him to do to announce the good news. In the other ending, everybody goes out and announces the good news. All right, um, let's stop and um, think together about a prayer of thanksgiving and um, the Gospel of Mary for a minute. Yes. Uh, just a comment. I'm uh, struck by your description of uh, the uh, prayer um, as queer rather than feminist, and it uh, reminds me of a, a bit of liturgy that's in one of the Uniting Churches uh, service, which talks uh, in the uh, Eucharistic service about, Blessed are you, O God, your son, our mother, nourishes and sustains us with the pure milk of his very self. And it just struck me how mm. that's also a queer description. Yes, so thank it you is. for that. Yes, and by the way, that, that, that is a quote from two different documents, the Odes of Solomon and the Gospel of Truth. Use those act, exact words that, that you, your prayer has. And I, I can't tell you how many people across the country and the world write me and say, can we use the, um, uh, the, God, the, the prayer of thanksgiving? Of course you can. I'm struck by the um, uh, way you're suggesting that a lot of these books came into the canon or came into the, your, book, your book by consensus and yet so much of the contents is conflictual <laughs> and, and as I understand it there was a good deal more conflict in the early church about what uh, a competing, and competing documents were produced and in conflict with each other. Mm. So could you, could you talk to us a little about early conflict, early censorship, early editing? Sure, thank you. Uh, lots of good stuff there. I can't do it all. But by the way, uh, the Council of, of New Orleans, we never agreed totally. It was not consensus. We always had a fight and we came out um, some licking our wounds and some not. Um, so that was conflict too. Yeah, I mean, so the general work of, of, I think, New Testament scholarship now is that the early Christ movements were deeply diverse. Um, and they were n hardly ever on the same page about anything. Um, so um, so um, I, I, I just want to underline your, the fact that, well, you know, the Bible disagrees with itself. The, New, the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Mark are in deep conflict about who Jesus was. If Paul had to meet Matthew, they would have hardly anything in common in terms of their view of whether, um, uh, how much value um, the, some parts of um, the message of, of Israel uh, 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 is in agreement. So, so um, the, one of, for me, one of the best things about the New Testament itself is that it, it is fighting with it, it, itself. Um, and it shows great diversity. Um, and, and we even know by the fourth century, what, the thing that um, Con Constantine criticizes when he becomes a Christian is that you all are saying different things. So he puts, you on, put, puts the bishops under house arrest until they can come up with a creed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's important to not think of any of this material as party line. 
This is, there was no central governance of the movements. Um, uh, there was no such thing as Christianity until the end of the second century at the very earliest. Um, and it wasn't that they thought they had to agree. They, I mean, I think you can say some things in common about the movement, but almost always you can find an exception. What you say is absolutely the case. I probably am lying when I use that absolutely. I'm, I'm interested in the missing pages, and I'm just curious about whether documents are still being found in marketplaces and digs in um, North Africa, and also whether there may be pages in those boxes that are not going to be dealt with for the next hundred years or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first of all, all manuscripts, including all of the manuscripts we have of the canon, are, are, have, are broken and have missing pieces. There are no perfect manuscripts until at least, I mean, none that are, aren't damaged until at least a thousand. Um, so everything is partial. Some of you saw last night a picture of the Gospel of Mary in, in one of the manuscripts. Half of it was missing. Um, uh, so on, on, on that page, uh, Oh, and what was your second question? Your second question. Oh, yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, so um, Karen King thinks that we have between ten and fifteen percent of what was written. Um, now, we know that there's lots of things out there. Politics now have basically stopped all digging in the in the Near East. So hardly any um, digs are going forward. Um, the ones in Israel are going forward more than most, but now a bunch of the really important uh, digs in, um, in Turkey are having a hard time. So, um, so it's, it's, uh, the digs are slowing down. We're sure that there's more. Um, uh, just because there, it, it was a steady stream of, of stuff until we, some of the digs stopped. And it is very true in museums, libraries, and universities. There are so many things in basements that haven't been dug up. We could spend, you, you notice, um, the, at, at Oxford and Cambridge, they're, they're just at the start of it. Um, that's true all over the Western world. Um, uh, and now the, the National Museum in Egypt has a whole bunch of them and, and a bunch of them haven't been processed. So it's, we're just at the, uh, at the tip of, of the iceberg uh, on that. The prob one of the main problems, however, is we have such a backlog of the ones we know. So Nag Hammadi, the Nag Hammadi jar in which we found 52 new documents from the early Christ movements, about a third of them haven't even had one dissertation written on them. Um, so there's massive uh, need on all levels to, to take in what, we've, w what we have and to find more. Yes? Just a quick one uh, for clarification. Um, you said that the uh, document was sort of dated around 125 CE and uh, it sort of is reflective of the content of uh, Timothy and uh, Luke and there was a kind of process happening in the church at the time about the leadership of women. Mm -hmm. um, there's a slight contradiction there when you then subsequently say that who, which Mary is this referring to? Uh, it's referring maybe to Mary Magdalene, but Mary Magdalene would have been well and truly dead by 125 CE. So I just don't, I don't know why we need to attach any particular individual to a story that was reflective of a cultural debate that was occurring probably at least 60, 70 years after the events around uh, Galilee. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the, uh, the Gospel of Mary, however, is, meant, is not meant, 
no one thinks that Mary wrote it. So this is not by Mary, it's about Mary. And, and Mary gets written about from, you know, from 50 to, to 500. I'm just wondering whether there, uh, first of all, I'm not quite sure what language, ancient language, these um, um, uh, manuscripts are, are, are written in. But do you think there are enough um, scholars with enough religious and cultural diversity today to, uh, who understand these ancient languages to be able to debate what they really mean? Mm, yeah, thanks. Uh, most of the, um, of the la most of the new documents are in Coptic because that was the language of North Africa at that time and when when they they were discovered hardly anyone in the United States knew ancient Coptic so there were a bunch of scholars who spent about a decade learning it when I had my um, change of mind at 55, I went back and studied with my first um, students on this material and at the doctoral level. We all learned Coptic together. And no, um, so I, I, right now I have probably about two dozen mentees who are working on this material. Only a third of them have begun their Coptic. So no, it's, it's a, I mean, you pile all of this evidence on together and you see um, how, how much could be done. I'm going to go on for just a little bit more. Um, I've got five minutes left. Uh, let's just take a look at the Gospel of um, Thomas. That means we're going to leave out on your, um, um, on your handout the Gospel of Truth and the Thunder Perfect Mind. The Thunder Perfect Mind I'm going to be preaching on tomorrow morning, um, and I meant, and we read part of it last night. But just uh, Thomas, especially since um, it's, it's such an exciting discovery, just to say overall um, that we, uh, we're still in disagreement about when the Gospel of Thomas was written. I would say the nearest to agreement would be the late first century. I think that there is a version of the Gospel of Thomas that was earlier, probably in the 60s, but the one we have that's complete from Nag Hammadi probably would be at the end of the first century. Other scholars, mostly conservative scholars who don't want to pay attention to it, think it's in the late 100s or early 200s. In other words, this is a defensive move to make that it, it have less um, uh, uh, relevance. Um, it is um, both, we've, we have parts of it in Coptic and parts of it in Greek, um, as is the case for the Gospel of Mary. When you, the, the Gospel of Thomas is, is um, a sayings gospel. Nothing happens in the Gospel of Thomas. It's all Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said. 114 short chapters. To me, that's not a negative, but a, um, when we also see that the, the um, cr crucifixion and the resurrection are not mentioned in the Gospel of Thomas, so Jesus doesn't say anything about crucifixion or resurrection um, in, the, in the Gospel of Thomas. This is a profoundly wisdom-based Gospel in which Jesus primarily brings deep wisdom. And interestingly enough, although it does not take, um, it, it does not uh, have anything to do with the resurrection, it has an ongoing life of Jesus. Jesus himself says, um, uh, if you turn over a rock, I'm there. If you split open a log, I'm there. So in other words, Jesus still lives, not necessarily by resurrection. Um, the uh, the 
material in in the Gospel of Thomas, um, about half of it has versions of, in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and about half of it is more or less completely new. So it's a stunningly interesting book in which um, you can't categorize it as, oh yeah, we know that, nor can you categorize that we don't know it. It's a wonderful thing to sit down, for instance, and see how the, there are little differences between a, a, um, one verse in Thomas and one verse in Mark. Sometimes almost the same, but not quite. So that means that scholarship on the Gospel of Thomas needs a lot more generations to figure out what the real voice of Thomas is completely. I think um, we're, we're right that there's enough of a voice there to, to really help us know how to live. Um, within the um, last minute, let me just read you a couple ones. 37, when you, his disciples said, when will we, when will you appear to us and when will we see you? Jesus said, when you strip naked without being ashamed and take up your clothes and put them under your feet like little children and tread on them, then you will see the child of the living one and you will not be afraid. 50, Jesus said, if they say to you, where have you come from? Say to them, we came from the light, the place where the light generated itself and established itself and has been made manifest in their image. If they say to you, are you the light? W say, we are the children of the light and we are the chosen of the living father. If they ask you, what is the sign of your Father in you? Say, it is movement and repose. My time's up. Thanks a lot.